Good morning, friends. Welcome to the Aquarium Online Academy. My name is James. I work here at the Education Department at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach. We are in Shark Lagoon today. We're going to be counting together. Are you ready to count? Not yet? Still warming up? All right, get those counting fingers ready. Maybe counting brain going. We're going to count a lot of things today. So I hope you're happy and ready to help me explore the animals and things about them. So if you want to participate, you can text my friend behind the camera, Sarah. We have a special number that you can participate with today. In the Aquarium Online Academy, you can text us questions or comments right here, 562-286-1838, and we'll have them here in the studio. I'll get to answer them live on the air. And if you would like, you can ask me things about animals we haven't talked about yet. But we want to start learning about some of our sharks today. So let's practice some observations together. I would like all of you watching out there at home or in the office or on your devices, wherever you're watching from, find something you notice going on in Shark Lagoon. It can be a thing that lives there. It can be colors that you see. It can be behaviors you see the animals doing. What do you notice happening in Shark Lagoon today? I notice the sharks look like they're racing around. That looks like that, that gray shark decided to take a shortcut. I guess Fern will have to learn how to take shortcuts. Fern is one of our zebra sharks. So there's a zebra shark way in the back there. And there's the other one right over there. Now, if they come up close enough to the camera, I'll show you which one is Fern and which one is Baby, because there is a difference. Fern has a little, like, notch, like a little cutout in part of her dorsal fin. So we'll look for that if Fern comes closer. Nope, it turned around. Never mind. Doesn't want, to, doesn't want us to tell you anything about it. Well, there's another fun thing I noticed. Look way back here. That stingray is hanging on to the wall back there. I'm not sure why, but this area in the back is what we call a holding tank. So we can pull this little gate across and it will close off so that we can have an animal back there for like a medical checkup, just to help train some feeding behaviors in there. But the stingrays decided to just chill out on the wall of that holding area instead of hang out anywhere else in Shark Lagoon. Now the cool thing is our biggest stingray, actually, their tail's like right there. The biggest stingray, our uh, reticulated whiptail ray, loves being in that back area, especially taking naps in the afternoon, all the way back there. And they do fit, even though she's like 400 plus pounds and six feet wide, she does fit back there. All right, well. Oh, oh, turtle. Shark is in the way. Turtle. Now, this is Theo, right? Yeah, this is Theo. Theo is one of the non-shark members of Shark Lagoon. And Theo, just very slowly, creeping along the floor. Where are you going, Theo? Theo sometimes does run into the camera. And not on purpose, I don't think. But sometimes they do. Well, what did you see happening with our sharks? What did you notice? I noticed they swim with their tail. Now their tail does this side to side motion, right? Well, their tail is one of their many kinds of fins that they have. How many fins do sharks have? Well, maybe we look at a picture of a shark and we can try and count them all. So we're missing the tail on this one, but that's okay, we already mentioned it. How many other fins can you count? You want to help me out? All right, let's start with this bottom one here. We have one, two, three. Now, here's the other thing. It's left and right. So even though like, like this, I have both arms, but you can't necessarily see both. I got both of them. We have to double count. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight fins. And their tail, too. Sharks seem to have a lot of fins. 
Well, why would a shark have so many fins? That's an interesting question. Why do you think sharks would have so many fins? I have a little shark stuffed animal friend here to help show a little bit more about them. So see, we have these two right here. These are their pectoral fins. You have these two here. These are their pelvic fins. And then there's two down here. Those are the anal fins. And then they have two dorsal fins. They have lots of fins in pairs. That's an interesting idea. Well, let's go back to watching Shark Lagoon, and maybe we can find an answer to why they have so many fins. Now, other fish don't have quite as many fins. So watch some of the other tropical fish in here. They don't have nearly as many. Here's my tropical fish stuffed animal friend. Kind of see-through at times because of our green screen. Oh, well. Well, so they have a tail. They have a top fin and a bottom fin, so dorsal, ventral. They have these two pectoral fins right here. But they, they're, they don't quite have as many as a shark. Well, both of the fish are swimming around and both use their tail. At least some of these fish are doing that. But think about what sharks do when they swim, where they swim, versus some of the other fish. So a lot of our sharks, like these reef sharks, they constantly move around. If they're moving around that much, they can't stop to pause. Some sharks have to swim in order to breathe, so they have to be able to force water over their gills. Imagine if, in order to breathe, you had vents on the side, and you had to run around with your mouth open all the time. One, that gets tiring, but two, that's how sharks would breathe. They have to force water in their mouth, out their gills, in order to get oxygen. It looks like it might be feeding time because they're getting very excited. About 8 to 9 o'clock in the morning is feeding time for sharks. So the sharks do get fed regularly, every day. They don't always want something to eat, but they do get fed pretty regularly. And when animals are trying to catch food, they might need to speed up a little bit. So you'll watch them speed up their tail, but these fins here are going to help them steer. So these are for steering left to right. But if you imagine the shark kind of like a torpedo or a football, when they're moving through the water, if they didn't have all these fins, they'd start spinning this way. Now, while that would be fun to watch and acrobatic and very cool, it might not help the shark do any of their behaviors better. They might not hunt better if they can spin around in circles. So these fins help stabilize them, kind of like the wings and the tail of an airplane help keep them upright. So these fins help keep the shark from spinning in directions they don't want to go. And then their tail does all the work to push them around. Now the little fish in there depends on the fish, well, how they swim. Most of the fish in there are also swimming with their tail, and then they can steer with the left and right pectoral fins. But other fish, they have to flap their fins in order to move around. This is one of those that do, will do that. They'll move their fins in combination, sometimes a little bit with their tail, a lot with their side fins to help move their bodies around. And then there's other fish like the wrasses who only push with the sides, kind of like you watch a bird flying. Now, how many fins did you notice on this butterfly fish? This one's kind of sneaky because a couple of their fins are see-through. Can you find them all? Well, we have the tail, so there's one. We have this bottom fin, that's two. Top fin is three. And since it's one continuous tall fin up here, we're just gonna count that as one. Well, there's other fish that have two fins on the top. And now here's the sneaky invisible one right here. You have this invisible side fin or pectoral fin. And there's a little one right there. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, because there's probably two down there, plus a tail. So some fish have lots of fins. Other fish don't have very many fins at all. And then there's the very fun fish called the mola mola, who only have two fins. Molas are an interesting animal. So this animal is very small, mm, not that big. 
actually about the size of an open palm. And they dig around to get into the coral reef with this long little snout to grab little algae off of the surfaces. So they need enough fins to help stabilize their bodies as they're moving around, get into the coral and come back out of the coral. But molas swim a little differently. Molas are open ocean animals the ocean sunfish, and what they like to eat out there are often jellies, but they'll eat other things like fish, maybe a squid if they can slurp it in. But they're not always the fastest. They can speed up enough that they can breach and jump out of the water, but their fins are just on the top and bottom. So if you imagine, like if you did your hand like this, top and dorsal, top and bottom fin like a mola, that is how molas swim. They push with these, and then their tail, eventually they just kind of grow into the tail, and the tail doesn't really do much. It's a kind of a rudder to help them steer, like a boat has a rudder to help it steer. But some of them are so big, their tail kind of disappears. Here's a mola out in the open ocean that we saw during a whale watch. So we can see their top fin, their bottom fin, and their almost tail. And the cool thing about molas is their skin at least besides their, their fins and swimming, their skin is very different. Other fish have scales. Now we kind of saw the scales on our other picture. You can kind of see the scales of this fish. So this is, that's this one. You can see, this one's not see-through either. <laughs> you can see their scale outlines right here with the colors. But molas don't have that. Molas don't have scales like we think of. Their skin is more like skin like our skin so their bodies are a little bit different they can swim pretty fast with only two fins compared to the eight of a shark and the seven of that butterfly fish but other fish just have different bodies and different designs well don't forget if you'd like to participate and ask us questions go ahead and text us at 562-286-1838 if you have bigger questions or questions that we didn't get a chance to answer during the program, if you're not watching live here on Monday, you can email us live at lbaop.org. All right, let's have Sarah find us another webcam, or even if there's a pre-recorded video that she thinks would be fun to count something in. I'm going to have her surprise us, and we can try and count something. Well, here at the aquarium, we have over 12,000 animals in more than 1.2 million gallons of water. They are not in water, are they? We give them water to play in, but they are one of the members of our 12,000 animal individuals that live here at the aquarium. These are the rainbow lorikeets. Now, lorikeets are a type of parrot. This is bigger than they would actually appear in person. They're about this tall in person. They're not very big. They're a small parrot. Now, how many parrots do you see sitting on the branch. There's one, two, three parrots. Now, these are all the same kind of rainbow lorikeet, but I notice something a little different. Hmm. What do you notice is a little different for one of our birds here? Hmm. Well, they do all look very inquisitive, very curious, sometimes a little sneaky looking. They do try to take the food from you if you get a chance to feed them here at the aquarium. You always have to hold onto that cup really tightly. They're very smart. But one of the things that you might see on this picture is the belly of this bird. Now, these are all green nape lorikeets. It means nape is like the back of your neck. So they have green on the back of their necks. But this one has a blue belly and blue on the sides of its body right there. But what happens is that some of these birds, there's different kinds of lorikeets out there. Some of them, when they have babies, they get combinations of colors. So when that happens, they might get a new color combination. We don't have too many of the fun color combos anymore. We mostly have just the green nape that you saw with the green belly, the green neck on its back in the stripy pattern on its chest. And we have another one called a Swainson's lorikeet that looks like a tie-dye pattern, mixy-matchy colors of yellow, red, and orange. So the Swainson looks like this. Little bit different. They definitely have a blue belly. And even though their neck, the back of their neck is green, just like the other is, 
Look at all this kind of orange and yellow mixed colors right here. All of this, I like to call it like a tie-dye pattern, this mixed color. That tells you it's a Swainson fluorokey. Now, out in Australia, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, where they're uh, native to, there's about 20 accepted kinds of rainbow lorikeet. So that means 20 different color combinations of that kind of bird. We have three types here at the aquarium. The green nape, the Swainson, we have a uh, Edwards lorikeet, which has a yellow chest. So there's some different color combos, and when different ones of them have babies together, you might get some new color combinations like we saw in the picture. Here is our Edwards lorikeet. A little bit different coloring. Same cute face, though. Now, the lorikeets are one of the special exhibits we have here where you get a chance to interact with them. So if you ever get a chance to visit us here in Long Beach, you can go inside the aviary. You have the option to get some food. You can purchase the food, and you can feed them, and you get to watch what they're doing. Now, there's not as many parts to count on them. They have two wing, two eye. But the cool thing to watch is how they feed. Their tongue almost looks like a paintbrush. And they dip their tongue into the cup of food that we provide for them. And when they do that, they can slurp or lap up all that food really quickly. When they're out in Australia and Indonesia, they might eat ripened fruit, flower pollen. Uh, they might eat some bugs, but not very many bugs. But they can't eat any seeds or grains. So it's not a true thing. We might mis misunderstand that a lot of birds would eat seeds or grains. But look at... Does that look like seeds or grains to you? That looks like applesauce to me. It might actually be applesauce. I don't know. They get, they get a lot of fruit from us and a lot of veggies. So they get a fruit and vegetable smoothie that almost looks like this twice a day. And it has a, a powder mixture and it has all of their uh, other nutrients they need. It's like kind of taking your multivitamin, but in a we mix the powder with liquid. We mix it with their other food and they get to eat like this. So here's our <laughs> yellow one, our Edwards lorikeet. The stripy chest pattern of the green nape. And fantastically, we have the third one, the Swainson, right here. See that orange and yellow combo color? Perfect video to get to see all three of our types of lorikeets. Now, we do have other birds that live here, but they aren't in an exhibit where you get to interact with them. We call them program animals. So sometimes you get to see some of our fun birds, like we have a red-footed booby bird. We have uh, a yellow-crested cockatoo. We have a macaw, and sometimes they get to come out and interact with our guests in a public space. We get to educate about them, but you don't really get an exhibit space with them in it. So if you do like birds, you still can come to the Aquarium of the Pacific, enjoy some fish when you want to, but go check out our bird exhibits as well. Well, let's jump back into the water and look for some more animals that we can explore together. Now, where will Sarah drop us next? Hmm. She's trying to think of a good one to go to. We have, I think, six different webcams that any of you at home can watch our animals from. We don't have a bird cam. That'd be fun, though. We have cameras in our aquatic exhibits with our animals underwater, except for one where we have uh, penguins. We have a camera above the water and a camera in the water. Now, what do we notice the penguins doing here? I see some of them swimming. And others are just chilling out on the beach right here. How many penguins do we have on the beach? Help me out. We have one, two, three, four, five penguins on the beach. Now, we have 21 penguins total. So there's a lot more penguins that we can't see. There's a bunch hanging out in the water here. There also might be some in their burrows. At an angle you can't quite see in the camera, but right up around here and over in this corner, there are holes in the wall. Those are their burrows. We provide them special burrows that they can get inside. They can rest. They can get away from each other if they want to. Everybody needs a little bit of alone time now and again. But also they can have their babies in there. Now it's past uh, season for babies. Like many birds, penguins lay their eggs in the springtime. And then by mid to late summer, they'd be about the full size of an adult. And they're at the point where they would fledge at that point. So if, these, if we were watching these birds out in their home habitat, in middle to late summer, the babies are all grown up and leave the nest. They grow up very fast. They start very small, and they get to about the full size of a penguin, which is about 
12 to 16 inches tall. And then they go off on their own. Now, our penguins are really cool. We have a group of rescued penguins who were found many thousands of miles away from their normal habitat. So normally they're supposed to live in South America. And if you imagine like my hand is like South America, like South America, the edge and the bottom edges of South America is where they would live. So around Chile to Argentina and a couple of our penguins, actually, I think it was five of them were found way up in Brazil, which is a little too far out of their range. They were young penguins at the time, and it was determined that they were not healthy enough to go back into the ocean. So the rescue team that rehabilitated them sent them to us so that we could have them. Now, most of the other penguins that we have in our exhibit have either come from another zoo or aquarium, or they were hatched here. We've been able to have lots of penguin babies at our June Keys penguin habitat here. Well, what else do you notice going on with the penguins? Oop, it's bath time in the water. Did you see that little like dance they're doing right there? Yep. They will groom themselves a lot. We can see this one kind of trying to groom parts of its body. Not only do they like to make sure that all their feathers just look fantastic, but they will try to spread oil on their body too. Seems kind of wrong for us to do it, but they have a gland back by their tail, actually almost back by the white spot you see on this one right here. They have a gland which makes the oil and they take some of that, they rub it onto their beak and they can spread it around their feathers. That helps keep their body waterproof. Their feathers are so dense that when they overlap correctly, their skin doesn't even get wet. And to improve or make it even better, they add some of that oil that they make on top of the feathers to make it more waterproof. Have you ever seen oil and water together? Maybe if you've not seen that before, you can have an adult at home help you. You can mix a little bit of oil and a little bit of water, shake it really hard, try to get it to mix. It doesn't like to do that. Eventually, all the oil will come back together and sit on top of the water. Oil and water don't really like to mix together. And because of that, we can coat surfaces with something oily or waxy, and it keeps water from getting through it. Penguins naturally learned how to do this, and they took the oil that they make from their bite right by their tail, and they spread it over their, their feathers to help them. And now this is a penguin, which looks like it has two beaks, two mouths. But here's the fun thing. When they get older, their beak gets really big and pronounced, really tall. So all of this is just extra growth on their beak. And now that might wear down a little bit in nature when they are using their beaks. But in general, when they get older, their beak just gets, keeps growing bigger and bigger. So this might be a little bit older penguin. And that's why they have this extra kind of bit on top of their, their beak. It doesn't move. This is all solid. So it's just one big upper part of their beak and one smaller part of the beak. But check a look or take a look at their feathers. You can actually see the huge number of feathers. You can see the edges of all their feathers right here. And the only skin that's really exposed is this pink stuff, the pink skin around their eye. And if it's really, really hot on a particular day in the summer, that's going to get more red. And that's kind of where they release body heat from. So like we'll sweat and we need to be in some air moving around and our bodies will cool down. But penguins don't sweat. Penguins only have that pink and red area right around their faces that will kind of help release body heat. Everywhere else there's feathers, it's trapping in all of that air and body heat because when they're in the water, the water's not very warm. That water will make them too cold if there's too much of their body exposed. Now we're actually getting close to the molting season for penguins. Penguins only molt once a year. Now this is not a molted penguin. This is what's, what they look like before molting, but they will molt once a year and they'll kind of drop everything. Now here's a cool thing about these penguins. What do you notice about the color of our penguins? Besides that they're black and white. I notice one stripe right here and one stripe with the white right here. The banded penguins have a stripe here and different banded penguins either have one or two stripes around their head. 
So depending on what kind of banded penguin, you'll see different numbers of stripes along their body. The Magellanic penguin has one main white stripe here and one main black stripe right there. Do you notice any spots on the belly of our penguin? Just a few over here by their arm, their armpit. There's five, six spots. Those spots are the same all the time. So they have just a few speckly spots right here, kind of like freckles. And even though they drop all their feathers every year, those speckly spots come back. So that's one of the ways we can tell some of our penguins apart. Well, if you haven't had any questions yet, that's okay. You can text in observations, you can email us questions, but we have enough time to probably explore one more exhibit or animal and count up some things that we can observe or notice about their bodies. So what have we learned so far? Well, Sarah's picking the next one. We counted the number of shark fins. We looked at how sharks swim. We looked at how, sh how other fish will swim and how many fins they might have. We looked at the birds and some of the color differences that happen on some of our birds including our penguins and how they have very special lines across their body that help us identify them too. Well, our next space might tell you a lot about numbers. I notice two sea stars. That's not what you know. Oh, so there are three sea stars. You're right. Oh, there's this lovely friend right here. This this, I believe, is Godzilla. No, that's really what we named this octopus. This is an octopus we had a couple years ago, and they were a very friendly octopus. Uh, Godzilla was a very big octopus, too. You can tell. Very big. This is actually very close to the actual size of Godzilla before, right before they passed away. Now, octopus don't live very long, maybe two to four years old, and that's okay. That's normal for all the octopus and squid. But the tough thing about counting with an octopus it's not that they have eight arms. Can we find all eight of them? One, two, three. That four one's kind of sticking out in the back. Five, six, seven, eight. They have eight arms, but check out all these suction cups all over their arms. You want to try and count all of those? I don't think we have time for that. We could try, but there's not enough time. And the reason I say that is because they could have up to or even over 200 suction cups per arm. So we're thinking maybe 800 to 1,000 suction cups once there are big octopus like Godzilla was like this. Now here's the fun thing. We have 10 fingers typically on our hands. We can move our fingers. We can play instruments. We can write. We can text. Well, our, all of our fingers are independent and can move separate from each other. All of the suction cups of an octopus can move independently from each other too. So they can decide that this one suction cup is gonna unstick from something, but the next one is not going to. That is really cool. Now the other cool thing, maybe you've heard this before, octopus can smell slash or taste with their suction cups. If they touch it, they can smell it or taste it. We have to touch things to our tongue in order to taste it. We can smell stuff in the air that smell is going into our nose and touching part of our nose, and that's how we can smell it. An octopus doesn't have a nose, so instead the suction cups do the job of both the nose and the tongue, and they can figure out what is and is not food. They can touch a thing and figure out if it's food. That's one of the games we play with our octopus. In order to give them some what we call enrichment, which is purposeful play, we'll give them puzzles, things that they have to open up and try and take the food out of. But it's not just so easy as like, Ta -da! they have to try and get the food out sometimes. In order to let them know that there is food inside of it, we'll rub some of the food on the surface of the container before we put it in the water. Well, that's a lot of information about an octopus in a short amount of time, but that's okay. We have plenty more of our Aquarium Online Academy scheduled for the rest of our weeks, but also you can go to our website and check out our own YouTube channel where you can look back into some of our previous episodes to learn more about the octopus and where you can wait until our next op uh, octopus episode comes up. We want to thank you for joining us on a Monday morning. We'll be back on Wednesday at 9 and 10 a.m. for our next Aquarium Online Academy programs. Thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your Monday.